Our story begins on the banks of the Galilean Sea in the small kinetic fishing village of Bethsaida, a town that straddled the border of Jewish and Gentile territories. However, that is precisely why the Roman Empire had built this village into a thriving imperial outpost, where Roman, Hellenist, and Jewish Israelites were forced to coexist. The year is about 1 BC, and Simon, the son of Jonah, is being born into this frenetic and explosive political tension. The culture of this fishing village will likely shape the rest of young Simon's life, Said another way, the Apostle Peter likely learned to do his talking with his fists from an early age, defending all that he thought was right and true and orderly in his corner of the empire. To push the point even further, Simon's father, John, ran a fishing venture with a man named Zebedee, who was likely a relative of Simon's wife. Mind you, this was not some sort of philanthropic small business venture. This was an industry run, maintained, and therefore heavily taxed by the Roman Empire. Said another way, when your daily catch went wrong, you had more than a bad day. You had to explain to the Roman government why you were stealing from them. And fishing was not an easy job to have either. Many Romans considered fishermen thieves, which is why in the third century, Athenaeus lumps fishermen together with money launderers, murderers, and crooks. It was backbreaking, demanding, skill-intensive work. However, being run by the Roman government, you did not easily escape the task. About the time when Simon turned 25, he married a woman from his hometown, and then, likely to meet the demands of the Roman fishing industry, moves with his wife and children to the vibrant port town of Capernaum. Simon, his brother Andrew, along with James, John, their father Zebedee, and all of their in-laws eventually find themselves in Capernaum around 27 AD. This is when they hear of an exciting new revolution taking place on the banks of the Jordan River. Like an American tent revival, Israelites from all over the Levant came to witness this new religious movement. Among these people gathered were tax collectors, fishermen, Pharisees, Roman guards, and many more. All kinds of people who hated each other and who had no one to take away their hatred. Andrew goes to join the movement full-time, leaving Simon, James, and John to tend the fishing business. The movement was started by John the Baptist, whose name bore the very symbol of all that he stood for. You see, ritual cleansing was one thing in the ancient world, but being baptized was almost exclusively reserved for Gentiles who wanted to join the family of Abraham and become religiously Jewish. However, John's new message to this diverse crowd was that all were so desperately fallen and in need of God's righteousness that everyone, Jew, Greek, and Roman alike, needed to be washed clean of their sin and baptized. More than that, it publicly aligned all who joined with him into the family of Abraham. This was a radical new message that sent shockwaves around Israel. And so it was on this day, when everything changed. Not only for Andrew and for Simon, but for all of humanity.
One day, a man came from Nazareth to be baptized by John, to publicly declare the beginning of his ministry and to align himself with humanity. John looked at Jesus as he walked by, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God! Two of John's disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Then quickly Andrew found his brother Simon, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah! Simon must have been thrilled, although unsure of his role in the drama that was unfolding before him. For you see, a few days later, Andrew and Simon were out fishing on the water when they meet the man from Nazareth personally. He begins teaching on the shoreline near where they're at, and then seeing the struggling fishermen, he gets in their boat and recommends they let down their nets on the other side. Simon, in familiar fashion, doesn't think it will do any good. However, to appease the new teacher, he does so. When suddenly, and miraculously, the net begins to fill with the fish they longed to catch. Certainly a subversion to their expectations, but also the Roman occupied business who will not be struggling for long. And then Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him, and he said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. And Jesus declares here that Peter will no longer be a fisher of the seas, but rather this rock upon which the church will stand will from now on be a fisher of men. When Peter sees and hears all that is going on, he quickly changes his tone. He falls to his knees. And in a similar fashion to Isaiah when he meets God, Peter says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. It is here when Peter leaves everything he owns, his business, his family, his security, his fishing nets, to follow the man that he believes to be the Christ. Now remember the world that Peter finds himself in, the Christ was coming to liberate him from the tumultuous oppression of Rome, and by dropping his nets, Peter is officially subverting the entire Roman occupation. By dropping his nets, Peter is aligning himself with the new revolution. As if this event wasn't enough to showcase the power the man had over the created order, Peter begins to see greater things than he ever dreamt possible. Soon after these things, the party of fishermen, along with Jesus and his mother, are invited to a wedding in the town of Cana. While there, the wedding party runs out of wine. It's a classic symbol of garden abundance in Hebrew literature, and so when Jesus miraculously turns the jugs of water into the best wine the host had ever tasted, Peter must have begun to form an idea of who this man was that had the power to bring more abundance and blessing than Rome ever could. However, things begin to take a turn for the worse in Peter's household. He is informed that his mother-in-law was very sick, and so he and the disciples, along with Jesus, go back to Peter's home. She had a high fever, and they asked Jesus to do something to help her. Well, he stood very close to her, and he ordered the sickness to go away, and the sickness left her, and then she got up and began serving them. We see along with Peter, that not only does Jesus have divine command over God's blessings, but a divine command over sickness itself. It would seem that the only thing this man from Nazareth can't do is control death. Perhaps hasn't done is a better phrase, because shortly after these things, Peter, James, and John don their apostolic appointment when Jesus makes them an inner circle, like David had. The inner circle of three disciples join Jesus and witness the miracle that raises a small girl from the dead. Who is this man? They must have wondered. The radical revolutionary they had imagined, the zealous religious prophet they had anticipated, seems to be more powerful, more good, more profound 
than they ever could have hoped for. And so, after their teacher miraculously feeds 5,000 people in the rural Galilean countryside and suggests they take a boat and row across the Sea of Galilee while he goes and prays, it is no surprise that amid the chaotic storm, Peter takes center stage. The disciples are rowing hard against the wind and the waves when in the shadowy distance they see the figure of a man emerge. It is a ghost, they shout. The profound experience must be seen to the height of its significance. The disciples must have recalled the scene of God's presence hovering over the chaotic waters of uncreation, about to speak order into existence, when Peter stands upon the bow and looks out. Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And dragging the wet fisherman into the boat, the chaos ceases raging. The next day, a massive crowd finds Jesus and his disciples on the other side of the Galilean Sea. When they come to him, they demand that he do another sign like they saw the day before. But Jesus, turning to them, proclaims that he is the bread of life, and whoever wants to follow him must eat of this body and drink of his blood. Not realizing what this saying meant, many turned back. This is when Jesus turns to the twelve whom he had chosen, and he asked them, do you want to go away as well? This is when Simon Peter answers for the twelve, and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have given the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It was some days later that the disciples found themselves in Caesarea Philippi. Primarily a Gentile city, this town was some 25 miles north of Galilee. It was here where Peter makes such a startling confession that all four gospel accounts attest to its significance as a key turning point in the history of humanity. You see, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, mm, Some say it's John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This one passage not only marks the turning point in all four Gospels, but it also accounts for one of the most contested passages of the Christian Bible and in human history. Wars have been fought and many lives lost over this passage. Upon this passage rests over 500 years of theological debate and the schism of the Catholic Church. In that time, four major interpretations have appeared, all trying to answer this question. Who is the rock that Jesus will build his church upon? Simply put, it's either Jesus himself, the very confession of Peter, Peter himself, or Peter and all those like him, meaning Peter typologically represents the church. However, all of them have their flaws, 
and to some degree, all of them are correct. Sure, the confession which Peter proclaims is the confession that those in the church will make. But the language here clearly states that Peter is the cornerstone, not this confession. Most likely, Matthew is interested in exclaiming one beautiful truth with this passage, that Christ is building a community for God and in himself, in the forgiveness of his grace and in his mercy. And it is true that Peter will hold a special place of authority in this new community that the whole world has been longing for since Genesis 3. He is the cornerstone. But it does not necessitate a strict hierarchical structure. Even Peter himself will admit that the entire church is God's temple being built together as living stones. Further, the keys given to Peter here are the authority of Christ himself to bring people into this new creation, this new community. But Peter's authority is only subservient to the Christ, as we see Jesus himself is holding these very keys in Revelation 1.18. To that end, we see Peter typologically representing the church, who, as a community of priests, bring people into the presence of God. We see the body of Christ across space and time and denominational lines used like Noah's Ark amid the chaotic waters of uncreation, insofar as it professes Christ in him alone. But even the rock upon which Christ is building this new community quickly becomes a stumbling block. Jesus begins to speak of his oncoming suffering and death in Jerusalem, and Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him strongly. Peter was given special honor by proclaiming Jesus to be the Christ, but for those that do not believe in his suffering and death, do not fully understand his divine messiahship, and they become a stumbling stone. But Jesus steadies this stumbling stone, and Peter repents. Never again will Peter confuse suffering with curse. Instead, Peter learns that suffering produces a steadfast hope in God and that this hope gives way to a genuine faith that has been tested by fire. After these things six days later, Jesus asks Peter, James, and John to accompany him on a trip up a hill. And it is here after Peter has seen the miracles, after Peter has witnessed life come from death, after Peter has confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus himself is transfigured before their very eyes. And we see that this man is not just a man at all, but fully God and fully man. The divine coming together in front of Peter's eyes. If it is true that Jesus has revealed himself to be God incarnate, the hypostatic son of his divine father, one in essence though distinct as a person, then it is no surprise that these events are quickly followed by a miraculous tale of some religious tax collectors who approach Peter questioning Jesus' loyalty to the house of God, the temple itself. Jesus responds in this way when Peter brings the religious leaders to him. Um, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said this, Peter said, well, from others. And Jesus said to him, hmm, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. And as Peter leaves to go out to the sea, he must have passed a bustling handful of 11 of the other disciples vying for the divine king's attention. You see, these events end Peter's time in Jesus's Galilean ministry. You see, Peter, along with 11 of his closest friends, and his master, the Son of God himself, make their way to Jerusalem. Upon entering, the Christ curses a fig tree and says that if the disciples have faith, then even this mountain 
will be moved into the sea. The Christ must have motioned toward Jerusalem, which sits upon a tall mountain landscape. The idea here being that Jesus has plans to overturn all that Jerusalem has come to stand for, namely, the separation of God and man by sin. For when Peter follows the Christ to the temple, Jesus weeps over the town. And then, in a flurry of rage, overturns the tables in the temple courtyard, claiming that it has become overrun by sinfulness. Peter and Jesus and the rest of the disciples hike to the top of a nearby hill that overlooked Jerusalem called Olivet, where the Christ begins to speak of the things which Peter may not have fully understood at the time, but instead of rebuking the Christ, he here stays silent. These events, in succession after all that Peter has witnessed, is valuable in understanding how Peter is coming to view the world and the story he finds himself in particularly the fact that no matter how much pain one must endure, as long as Jesus is there, saving you from the chaotic waters, all must be well. As the end of his master's life draws to a close, Jesus instructs Peter and John to locate a man in the city who can host them. What Peter does not know is that this secrecy allows for one of the twelve to remain in the dark as to where the events of the Passover will take place. For one of Peter's closest friends is about to betray his Lord and Master, the Christ. Jesus has gathered Peter with the other disciples in the upper room. As Peter's life with Jesus began at a party where Christ's control over God's blessing poured out in chalices of wine, so it will end in nearly the same way. Jesus bends down and begins to wash Peter's feet, and he recoils at the idea. Jesus gently corrects this behavior and reminds Peter that those who confess Jesus as the Christ must from here on out imitate him. Finally, Jesus begins to warn the intimate gathering that trouble is brewing. He claims that one of them will soon betray him. Peter jumps at this and boldly proclaims that he would never betray Jesus. He would follow him even to death. However, Jesus sees things differently. He believes that Peter will deny him three times before the cock crows. After the meal and clearly stricken with grief, Jesus goes to a small courtyard garden named Gethsemane. He asks Peter, James, and John to join him watching out for him while he prays. The ensuing events will be etched in Peter's mind for the rest of his life. The revolution he has longed his entire life for has begun. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And Jesus heals the ear of the servant. They arrest Jesus and carry him away in chains. Peter and John follow at a far distance. The other disciples have scattered. The night passes into a deep darkness and Peter's mind goes with it. He begins to have a nervous breakdown outside of the court where Jesus is being held on trial. He begins denying that he ever knew the man and upon the third denial, he indeed hears the sound that was prophesied before him and the Lord turns and looks at Peter. And Peter remembers the saying of the Lord, how he had said, before the rooster crows today, you will have denied me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Now, we will never know where Peter went after this. Likely, he ran for safety, like all the other disciples, save one. Likely, Peter abandons his master for death by crucifixion. I can only begin to imagine what the next several hours were like for these men. The minutes must have ticked by painfully slow as they awaited their inevitable arrest and death. Not only had these men lost a man that they loved, but they had lost the man who was love incarnate.
on the third day after Jesus' death, on the first day of the week. It should come as no surprise that a few of Jesus' female disciples go to anoint the body in proper burial fashion. As Peter sits in the upper room waiting for them to come back, he suddenly hears a banging on the door. The three women burst into the room and in a fervor of exciting zeal begin to explain exactly what they just saw. A Peter and John now needing to see this for themselves take off running. While Peter loses the race, he confirms with his own two eyes that the women were far from lying. They were speaking the most true thing that has ever occurred in human history. In fact, the women were the first witnesses to the greatest, most miraculous, most reality-altering event that has ever and will ever take place. For as Peter and John get to the tomb where Jesus was laid on the first day of a new week, as creation begins to dawn anew, they realize that the man who they called the Christ has risen indeed. The risen savior and reigning king of the universe tells the company to wait for him back in Galilee. And so the disciples head back to Capernaum, likely needing to replenish their funds and also needing to appease the Roman government again. The disciples decide to head back out and catch fish. When on a particularly slow day, they see Jesus waiting on the shoreline and Peter can't help himself. He throws himself into the sea. And whether this was an act of desperation to get to the Lord out of awe or away from the Lord out of terror, we may never know. Eventually, he comes to shore, however, and Jesus is there waiting for him nonetheless. Three times, Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And three times, Peter says that he does. Three times, the risen Savior commands Peter to care for his people. And three times... The Christ acknowledges and powerfully forgives the denying disciple. For all the fear and anxiety the past several days had brought Peter, I can't imagine how beautiful and healing it must have felt to be fully restored to his Lord, the Christ. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. While this may not be the end of Peter's life, and he certainly has a long task ahead of him, it does close out the most catalytic chapter. And while he may not know it yet, Peter is about to go on in the power of this very resurrection, born again to a living hope, as he begins to live a life that even angels will long to look into. Because this reality-shifting event of the resurrection means that by God's power, the church is being guarded, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven. Because little does he know now, but soon, Peter will enter into the very suffering and death that his Lord and Savior himself went through. Forty-three days after gazing upon the death of his master on a cross, Peter found himself gazing upward with the other eleven disciples. By now, Peter had realized that the one he had called teacher was actually his God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter had likely lived his entire life as a series of impulsive failures, 
But when he was restored by this God in Galilee, in forgiveness and in love, Peter realized something. He realized that no matter how far he fell, Jesus Christ had caused him to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that was imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It will be this very focus on Christ's unchanging election of him that will allow Peter to walk through the fiery trials that await the rest of his life. It had been 40 days since Jesus' resurrection, and the disciples now stand atop the place where Jesus had predicted his own death, Mount Olivet. And they watch him rise to eternal life incarnate, rise to the throne of the Father, and to sit at the Father's right hand as God incarnate eternal forevermore. This is the moment that will mark the rest of the disciples' life. If it is true that Jesus, the forgiving, loving, merciful Jesus, has revealed the very essence of the character of God, and if it is true that this God has now taken his rightful place on the throne of creation, well, then the disciples can only conclude with Jesus that they must go out and proclaim this good news to all of the world, immersing the empire in the reality of the triune God. They returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, and when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Recently, one of their own had betrayed Jesus. This is what led to his death and subsequent resurrection. But in an act of desperation, the man took his own life. But the scriptures had been clear. For the kingdom of God to come, the twelve were going to be united. So Peter, by his typical leadership, declares that another needs to take the place of the betrayer. So all of the disciples present, men and women, elect Matthias to be the twelfth and final member of their team. This seems to be a key that unlocks a door in the heavenly realm. For some days later, suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. In divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is one of three keys that Peter will use to unlock the doors of the kingdom and thus fulfill his mission in the apostolic age. You see, nearing the end of Jesus' life on earth, he gave Peter these keys to the kingdom. Peter is given the authority to admit entrance into the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel, an authority that is subsequently granted to all who are called to proclaim the gospel. It would seem that as Peter lives out his great commission, he hands this responsibility off to all who would proclaim Jesus as their God and Savior. We begin to see Peter, and by extension, the church, as Christ's divine image out into the world. This is why Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. And quoting from Joel 2, Peter sees this moment in history as the culmination of all that the Israelites had waited for. All they needed to do was repent and be immersed in the triune God. Pentecost also marks an important turning point in our story, not just for the authority that's given to Peter. But now, the 3,000 people saved on this day return back to their hometowns and begin planting gardens of God's community all around the empire. Sometime later, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask for alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. 
and he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. When the crowds stood around Peter and John and the man, they were amazed at the sight. And so Peter saw this as an opportunity to tell more people about the love, strength, and forgiveness that he had found in the Jewish Messiah. When Peter gives this sermon, however, the Jewish leaders do not go back to their hometowns and begin to plant garden communities around the empire. Instead, they seize Peter and John and they put them in prison. After a night in prison, they bring them before the Jewish elders and strictly charge them not to proclaim that Jesus is the Christ. So Peter and John return back to their Edenic garden community, rejoicing. But it is here when the community begins to break down and rot. A man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds. When Peter finds out about this, the power of God rushes through the body of Christ like a heart attack. And in an inversion of the story of Adam and Eve, Ananias and Sapphira die where they stand. This strange story is best seen in light of its context. It would seem that Ananias and Sapphira give us a precursor, a picture of the false teachers that the early church will face and how it will shape the rest of the Christian story. You see, this was a time where the Spirit of God was richly blessing the unity of the young Christian community. To see it fracture and break so quickly should remind us of Adam and Eve eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, or Israel worshiping the calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. This story explains, Christian community will suffer in the hands of a sinful humanity, but God will always remain sovereign over it, rooting out those who will become false teachers by his power and by his strength not by human cunning. So we see, the power of Christ works powerfully and providentially through his body and through our main character, Peter. God works even through Peter's shadow as a dim reflection of his magnificent grace in the world. And though Peter with his brothers are arrested again, the Spirit of God miraculously frees them. Even when they are rearrested the next day, the wisdom of God works in and through the Jewish leadership to set them free once again. That is why, despite being beaten mercilessly, Peter and his brothers always go away rejoicing. But we can see that these events, the false teachers and the opposition from the authorities, have been but birthing pains for the young Christian church. One day, the deacon, Stephen, finds himself giving a powerful sermon to the Jewish religious leaders. Enraged by his remarks that they have killed the one hope that they had, they begin to hurl stones at his head. And throwing aside their cloaks with all reason, they kill him in cold blood. The death of Stephen the martyr rings like a shot fired around the Roman Empire. The thousands of Christians who had given their lives to serving the Christ wake up and begin to flee back to their hometowns. The following part of the story was learned through careful research into the wisdom of men and women who lived centuries after Jesus' ascension. Scenes in black and white should be taken as historical events, not the inspired word of God. Even though scholastically disputed, we believe this story to be accurate to the best of our abilities. 
While these events do not have an associated chapter and verse, you can decide what it means for you. Over the next several decades, the Mother Church in Jerusalem began to establish city centers for Christians fleeing persecution around the empire. These Christian centers were called sees, and by the end of the first century, four sees had been established in the largest, most vibrant cities. Like Levitical cities of refuge, these sees were created in Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, and of course, Rome. After the Jerusalem Sea was established, the second of these ancient seas would have likely been Antioch, one of the first communities to call themselves Christian. And so, in light of growing false teachings, the apostles felt it right to put leaders over each church community. James was elected to be the leader of the mother church in Jerusalem, and Peter was given the role of leading the church in Antioch. Meanwhile, in Samaria, the church was about to encounter its first real historic enemy with a face, Simon Magus. His name was derived from the singular form of the Greek word magi, meaning magician or sorcerer. Often referred to as Simon the Magician, this itinerant Samaritan became the founder of the earliest Christian heresy known as Gnosticism. Gnostics denied the material world and therefore the incarnation of Jesus, claiming that he could not have been God because of the immorality of the material. Who was God then? While Gnosticism is an extremely varied tradition, many will concede that God is some sort of impersonal, transcendent, mysterious force that could inhabit anybody. Which is why, by the second century, we find a Simonian sect of Gnostics in Rome who worship Simon himself as Yahweh, the God of Israel. Or Zeus, depending on who you asked. It was this Simon Magus who meets Peter and John in a Samaritan city center when Peter uses the second of his keys to unlock the door for the Samaritans to enter into the kingdom of God in Christ. The Apostle Peter lays his hands on the Samaritans with John, and the Apostles create a microcosm of the events from Pentecost one year prior. This is a Samaritan Pentecost. However, Simon Magus, seeing this outpouring of the true God's divine power, desires to buy it. Given his history, he likely believes that he can turn around and perform these incredible feats of healing magic for the people, given the right price, of course. But here, the Apostle Peter curses him. He says, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. And though Peter demands that Simon Magus repent, he does not. Instead, he slips away until an opportune time. Now, as Peter went here and there among the Samaritans, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately, he rose. Now, as if Peter didn't think this was an amazing healing, there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. And so, Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, and he knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise, much like his Lord and Master said to Lazarus. And she opened her eyes, 
And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. And then calling the saints and the widows, he presented her alive and it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. And so Simon thought it well to stay in Joppa for a while with a tanner. While the miraculous events in Joppa are happening 38 miles north in Caesarea, the Lord is moving once again powerfully in his magnanimity. This is a moment that will define the rest of human history as a centurion, a leader of the Italian cohort, goes out on his rooftop. Cornelius was his name and he worshipped the God of Israel. Praying one day during the daily burnt offering, God appeared to him in a vision, and he told him that his prayers had been answered in the person of Simon Peter. And this is where we find Peter going out on his rooftop in Joppa at the same time. Suddenly, Peter sees a sheet of clean and unclean animals descending upon him. Though Peter was perplexed and appalled, he begins to discern the meaning of this vision. God is revealing the people he has created for himself in accordance with the prophet Isaiah. Peter now realizes it clearly. God's community is structured in such a way that the Holy Spirit will pour forth out into Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is when Cornelius' men find Peter and bring him to the house of the centurion. Peter is about to unlock the door for a Gentile Pentecost and thus use the last of his keys from his life. In the short sermon that he gives at the centurion's home, you can hear the trepidation and fear that no doubt saturated every word. Peter must have recalled the many times his friends and family had been hauled off by the Roman government, imprisoned, or even condemned to death. He must have recalled the centurion whose ear he had cut off at his master's capture. But it was in the midst of these memories that the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. We may never know what Peter was up to during those days in Samaria, reaching the corners of the earth for the first time. But around the empire, trouble begins to stir in the hearts of powerful men. When the gospel was brought to the Jewish leaders, they killed the first person that spoke, Stephen. When the gospel was brought to Samaria, James the Great is captured and killed by Herod Antipas. And seeing that it pleased the Jews, after the gospel is brought to the Gentiles, Peter is imprisoned shortly after by Herod. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. He was bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And after escaping and relaying all that happened to him, he departed and went to another place. The year is likely around 43 AD, around a festival time in Jerusalem. Peter, realizing that the time he thought he had is running out in light of increasing opposition around the empire, he boards a ship ready to take Jewish pilgrims back to one of the biggest Jewish diaspora centers of the ancient world at the time, Rome itself. Peter likely kept this trip relatively quiet for a time, 
After all, having just escaped prison, it might not have seemed tactful to call attention to the fact that the Church of Rome was founded by a much-wanted criminal who was a fugitive from justice. And Peter remains in Rome for about two or three years, laboring intensely to secure and encourage the church community that he had founded there. We may never know if Peter intended on staying in Rome indefinitely, but we do know that by 46 AD, a severe famine had hit the mother church in Jerusalem. And so, Peter makes his way back to this central sea. While Peter was in Rome, Paul and Barnabas had completed their first missionary journey. They reported all that they had done to the elders and apostles in Jerusalem, then gifting them with the funding that they had received throughout the empire so that the famine would be bearable. Soon after, they make their way back to their home church in Antioch. Peter arrives days later, likely visiting the church he used to lead and thanking them for their generosity. But it is here where Peter stands condemned in front of the Gentiles. For when certain men came from James, Peter refuses to eat with the Gentiles who he had helped graft into the family of God. Paul's rebuke of Peter is harsh, but Peter's actions have been inappropriate and out of step with the gospel that he has preached in the past. And so, Peter repents and he reconciles with his beloved brother Paul. Paul then writes to the Galatian church that he had planted just years prior, in about 48 AD. One year later, in 49 AD, the famine has only gotten worse. But you see, a spiritual famine has begun to infect the churches around the empire as well. As evidenced by the Galatian letter and an account in Acts, where legalism infects Peter's founding church in Antioch, a council needs to be called in order to address the growing number of Gentiles in the Christian movement. The main issue at hand is this. Is it necessary for Gentiles to circumcise themselves so that they keep the law of Moses? Peter is the first witness on the stand, and he relays everything that happened at the Gentile Pentecost in Caesarea, how the Holy Spirit has been poured out even on the Gentiles circumcising their hearts. James the Just, as leader of the Jerusalem Sea, adjudicates. The final verdict is clear. Gentiles have been saved by the grace of God and for no other reason. Therefore, out of reverence to this salvation, they should reject all forms of idolatry, but nonetheless do not need to become ceremonially Jewish. Shortly after these things, Peter feels it necessary to strengthen, encourage, and support several churches across the empire, likely trying to embolden their hope in the face of false teachings and deep persecution. Peter, along with his wife, go on their only missionary journey. They travel first to Antioch in Pontus, then through Cappadocia into Galatia and up into Bithynia until finally making their way all the way down into Corinth. While in Corinth, a small faction of Peter-loving Christians appear and begin to take his word more seriously than the other apostles. This clan may have been small, but they were certainly deeply influential. That's why Paul writes to the Corinthians in about 54 AD to remind them that all of Christ's disciples hold the same authority and power, being God's image out into the world as they are. He says, as one plants, so another waters, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. It was while Peter was in Corinth, Simon Magus, Peter's ancient enemy, appears in Rome. Later writings of Simon Magus will show up bearing his very own name. In these documents, Simon claims to be the triune God who has appeared to the world in different forms. To Samaria, the magician has graciously appeared as God the Father. To Israel, Simon is God the Son who reconciles Israel back to himself and to the pagan world he lives among. The sorcerer is the powerful and magical 
Holy Spirit. In the Simonian creation myth, the first thought, Enoia, was produced from the Father's mind in order to create the angels, who in turn created the visible universe. These angels, however, imprisoned the first thought out of jealousy, placing her in a human body so that she could not return to the Father. She was thus doomed to pass from body to body, the most recent being that of Helen. In order to redeem his first thought, the father descended in human shape as Simon and offered salvation to human beings if they would recognize him as the first god. <sighs> so of course, when Peter learns about this and how his precious Roman church has fallen prey to this heinous and unjust teaching, Peter rushes back to Rome around 55 AD. All the while, Emperor Nero has ascended to power, and Roman persecution has only intensified. For the next 10 years, Peter will work tirelessly to push back against the false teaching and persecution, fighting for all that he knew to be right and true. Peter must have seen the Roman Church as the crown jewel of the Christian movement. After all, he had lived and suffered his entire life under the oppressive thumb of the empire. He knew that the Messiah was coming to liberate him and his Israelite family. So to see the Messianic movement take hold in the Roman city must have echoed the words of his master, you are a city on a hill. It was Christ in Babylon. And so over the course of 10 years, slowly and organically, the four C's began to look to Peter's leadership in Rome. Likely this was the case because of Simon Peter's high leadership position among the 12 during Jesus's ministry. From Alexandria to Jerusalem, Ancient accounts record Peter settling moral, philosophical, and theological disputes that arose around the Christian world. Then in 64 AD, a power-hungry Nero lusts after a plot of land next to his home on Palatine Hill. He longs to expand his 300-acre monolith of a palace east. Only a pesky residential neighborhood stands in his way. And so, when a fire begins in the Roman heat of July, it spreads faster than anyone could have imagined, burning huge portions of the Roman city to the ground. In a desperate attempt to flee the responsibility of this monumental disaster, Nero blames the Christians. An outpouring of hatred, floods the Roman streets, and Christians are stolen from their homes, burned alive, roasted in animals, and crucified. Peter, as the leader of the Roman churches, knows that he will soon be martyred. This is why he writes his only two letters to churches across Asia Minor over the course of just two years, to remind them that after his departure, they may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter has worked nearly his entire life to push back against the Simonian heresy. That's why he says that the apostles did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he assures them, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, of his majesty indeed. You see, Peter is captured sometime in and around 64 AD. He's likely tortured and then called to his execution, fulfilling the words of his God and savior, Jesus Christ, that another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Peter is condemned to be crucified, likely a cruel mockery of the faith that he professes. 
unable to take a blessing such as that, dying in the same way as his God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Peter asks to be crucified upside down. You see, Peter was able to endure a life of bitter suffering from the small town of Bethsaida to the Roman Empire because he had set his hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation being that according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. For you see, Peter's ability to suffer was foundationally rooted in Jesus being God incarnate, and that this God will return in the very same glory and majesty that Peter himself witnessed on the Mount of Transfiguration. And so, while he hang there, Peter must have recalled the words he wrote just a few years prior. You were ransomed so that you would become a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Hey, thanks for exploring the Bible with us over here at Bible Inbound. You know, if stories really do affect our actions out into the world, then how we interpret the Bible really matters. And we believe that Christians should be excited to read their Bibles because the gospel is proclaimed throughout it. And so I like to say that we are here to discover the Bible by uncovering the gospel in every biblical story. If that's a mission that you would like to support, then you can do that at patreon.com. Patreon is this place where you get a bunch of people to donate small amounts of money to help fund an organization's mission. And so if you would like to help others discover the Bible by uncovering the gospel in every biblical story, then you should learn more at patreon.com slash Bible Unbound today. Again, patreon.com slash Bible Unbound. And that way, we can all help others discover the Bible by uncovering the gospel. And I'd love to see you there. Until then.